This is Zengeance, a first-person shooter VR game with a rhythmic breathing mechanic. Studies have shown that therapeutic games like Zengeance can have a powerful effect on reducing stress and improving mental health. But until recently, no games have been approved by the FDA. And that meant that the makers of therapeutic games couldn't get paid by insurance companies, which makes it nearly impossible to run a profitable business. Now, for the first time ever, the FDA has approved five mental health games, including an SDK or software development toolkit from Deepwell DTX, the makers of Zengeance. Digital therapeutics companies are now scrambling to take advantage of this new opportunity. To better understand how this FDA announcement is shaking up the medical gaming world, I talked to Ryan Douglas, head of Deepwell DTX. Let's start with the good news. What's changed and what does it mean for the digital therapeutics industry? The Digital Therapeutic Alliance is the trade association that has been lobbying Congress to get some payment in place for this stuff, and they have been successful. Right now, we're in the comment period, and there's going to be three new reimbursement codes coming out in 2025 that tie digital therapeutics to a payment schedule. And that payment schedule is pretty amazing because they're not just going to talk about paying the content creators. They're talking about paying the MDs and the docs to prescribe, initiate, and follow these treatments. So we're going to finally see media and medicine connecting in a way that understanding is going to be you know, much more ubiquitous. How big is the digital therapeutics industry? And how do you see your role in it? To sort of give you some sense of what's out there at the moment, there are 350,000 wellness apps. 90,000 of them were created during the COVID emergency order where you were allowed to take a wellness app and make medical claims about it around anxiety and depression. But since November of 2023, that's over. However, if you look in there, there's still 20,000 of them calling themselves a digital therapeutic, which means you treat or mitigate disease. And you have to have the FDA's clearance to do that. Now, this is where it gets sticky. Only 20 of them have been cleared. Only five are for mental health. And here's the thing that we're excited to say. Deepwell is number five in that clearance. We got our clearance, but we are the first one ever to be a software development kit. We didn't clear a game. We cleared a toolkit that can attach to media and draw it into the reimbursement stream. So how does your SDK make it easier for developers to build therapeutic games and apps? It allows the media to be dynamic. It allows it to be delivered over the counter or through orders and prescription. It allows it to be on any mobile platform and it's available through any commercial means. So we've taken a lot of the friction out of these situations. When you need a new digital therapeutic, you don't want a new piece of hardware. You don't want to go to an environment you don't know, and you don't want to be attached to something that you can't afford, all of which you know, didn't make any sense. If you take the reimbursement codes and then you take the toolkit that Deepwell has just cleared as a software development kit, you have the ability to attach media to the medicine and bring it into the reimbursement stream. Why is it so hard for therapeutic games to get cleared by the FDA? How did the FDA treat software before this announcement? So the FDA looks at all digital therapeutics or did up to this point as software as a medical device, SAMD. And that concept comes all the way back from the first software we saw in defibrillators and, and other sort of implantable devices. They want a static piece of hardware that never changes. They want a static piece of software that has been verified and validated on that platform. They want that put together and then they don't want it to move. But if we think about it and you think about what is compelling about media and how media works in its entirety, what makes it accessible is that it's on thousands of different devices. If you're running on Android, there's about 1,100 active devices running at all times. They're updating their operating systems at will. There's complete um, motion within there. That is something that the FDA doesn't like. On top of it, static media is not attractive. So if you're talking about an interactive media environment, we're constantly needing to iterate. So what we saw fundamentally go wrong is the first companies that came through the door, they worked within the present regulatory environment instead of reshaping that environment to a way that was going to make sense for the digital therapeutic and saying, look, you know, uh, FDA, regulatory bodies in general around the world, this is not a defibrillator. And so it's going to work differently. And so we're going to have to look at issues of safety or effectiveness differently. What new opportunities does your SDK open up for game developers? So think about this. We've built a new economy here. If we go to pitch a new game at the moment, our job is to go find something that's going to pay for it. When we do that work, we're creating brand new worlds, great brand new environments. And most of the people that are funding are asking us to see three to five slides on this amazing new experience we're going to build. 
and 20 new slides on our monetization schedule. It's breaking the hearts of the experienced designers. Nobody wants to be building Skinner boxes, taking advantage of people. And on top of it, it's not really working anymore. It used to be about 2% of our folks that played our free-to-play game ended up being our whales, the people that was going to hold us up and, and take care of us. And finding a player in that game would cost us between 3 and $5. We're not living there anymore. Right now, we're looking at about 1% of people pay for games at all, and only 5% of that 1% are somebody that's going to spend on the higher level of this. And the acquisition costs of anybody who plays the game even free are looking more like $15 at the moment. So we're in a really different place. But if you're an experienced designer or game designer, you're going to have a new choice now. You can design for reimbursement as a digital therapeutic. And that means you don't spend time on your monetization schedule because you are hooked up to payment. And those payments go on for a period of time as long as people are engaged with the therapeutic and require it. This is the return of the golden age of media, as far as I'm concerned, connecting it up to a greater purpose and letting people know really what these designers have known for a long period of time, that they want to create a really special experience for you. And of course, it's having an emotional and physical effect on you. So that's Ryan's vision for the future of therapeutic games. On this channel, we help you innovate smarter, see the future, and build products that make people's lives better. If that sounds interesting to you, make sure to subscribe. We would love to have you join us. And if you'd like a deep dive into what the Deepwell SDK means for game developers, make sure to check out this video next. I'll see you soon.